Hey, what's up everybody? Fred Minnick here. And today I want to go over the state of bourbon. And here we are right now, March 1st, 2024. And I did not think I'd be having this conversation this early. But I've been getting hit up by a lot of people talking about how the industry is changing. Some people are coming at it out of fear that the bourbon boom is about to bust. Others are kind of sitting back eating their popcorn, hoping that they can find Pappy Van Winkle on the shelf again. Uh, neither thing I think is going to happen. But there are some things that I do want to look at and address and kind of give my take on it because I do think it's important that we watch it. First of all, when I am when I am looking at the state of the industry, as I did with my book, uh, Bourbon, the Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Whiskey, I look at a few factors. Uh, the first factor I look at is how are the publicly traded companies are doing. And the reason why I do that is because that information is so accessible. You can crack open uh, a quarterly or yearly financial report from Diageo, uh, Brown Foreman, MGP, companies like this, and you can get an idea of how that company is, th their goals, you can get an idea of where their pitfalls are. And three major things have happened already this year, and I wanna address each one of those. Uh, one, Brown Foreman sold one of its cooperages to the Independent Stave Company, which is the largest uh, barrel manufacturer in the world. Brown Foreman still has cooperages, they're still making their own barrels. I just never personally felt like that facility uh, fit into their portfolio, and I didn't think they needed another one. Like, they, they already have a behemoth of, of a cooperage facility and setup. So I, I don't think that was anything to be alarmed about. I think that was one where that cooperage didn't fit in the portfolio, someone else needed one, and there's a chance to or, you know, earn a little revenue there. But, you know, Brown Foreman is, is going to be fine when it comes to making barrels. So I think that's one that is, you know, just kind of like cross that off as like, it's just like selling something that you don't need anymore. Um, MGP, it was announced, uh, I would think a few days ago, today's March 1st, this was announced, I think February 22nd, 24th, somewhere around there. And they're down 20% for the year. And that was, you know, that's one where, you know, MGP is a different kind of company. They're not like Brown Foreman, where they've got a juggernaut in Jack Daniels. MGP is a company that's supplying whiskey to a lot of, of other brands. And so I think that's an interesting, that's an interesting one to look at, but I don't, you know, just seeing, just seeing their readjustment to it already. So just yesterday they announced um, a $100 million share repurchase program. So, you know, they're already trying to fix that, if you will, but again, this is stocks, so I don't. This is one thing to look at to see how a company's going. Uh, Diageo also had a, uh, a very soft report recently, and they put the blame mostly on their efforts in Latin America. So if you think about these companies, they're global companies like the United States. The domestic trends here, they matter, but they they they're not the whole picture. And so Diageo put a lot of efforts into Latin America, and they're saying they didn't pan out for whatever reason. Now, while that information is available, you can go and look at these uh, reports yourself and make your make your own, you know, decisions or your, make your own opinions. Put them in the comment section, please do. I'll also put the links to each one of those financial uh, things I just talked about in the description. Now, that is publicly traded, you know, so that they are not Sometimes these companies are doing things based on what Wall Street wants, not necessarily what you want or what a liquor store wants. Now, this is a trend that is not based on any kind of, it's not based on, how should I put this? It's not based on research. It's not based on a company coming out publicly with issues that are happening. It is based on anecdotal evidence that I have been hearing for the last three months. Now, granted, I talked to a lot of people uh, about this, uh, retailers, distributors, and suppliers. And there are reports from people 
that the retailers are telling me that a lot of retailers are telling me that customers are not buying new products. So they're coming in and they're buying their mainstay bourbon that they typically get, whether it's Maker's Mark or Old Forester uh, or Wild Turkey 101. I mean, they're just focusing on what they like. They might, they might splurge a little bit, but they are staying within that window and they're not getting uh, a new brand to them that's a blend of straights from two different uh, states or three states, or they're not trying that new craft rye whiskey. And that is indeed a problem that we should flag and look at as like, have we reached that point where consumers are like, hmm, I know what I want. I'm done with that experimentation side. You know, that's something to be very much looking at. And for the newer brands that are out there, that's got to be scary. But at the same time, there's enough tools that are out there that people can build an audience and they can build a, um, as long as their whiskey's good, you know, they can start, they can get that shelf space. Because here's the thing, if the whiskey's good, that will overcome everything all the time. A couple other things that I've heard from distributors in every state is going to be different in terms of how they can take payment. But I've had some distributors tell me that they are not getting uh, paid like they normally do by retailers. And the, and the retailers are not ordering new product. Uh, so going back to that conversation of like, they're not, you know, no one's trying new things. People are trying new things, but they're not, they're, they're a little bit more cautious about it. According to distributors I've talked to, and I would say, I'll, let's just say 12 states. So I feel like that's a pretty accurate number of the people I've been talking to. And they're all reporting very similar issues. Uh, but this is the one that's the scariest for me. And there are distillers who are trying to take advantage of new streams of revenue uh, from like whether barrel brokers or doubling down on their tourism efforts because their whiskey sales are soft. In fact, I've had several distillers tell me that they have either stopped distillation or they've slowed back on distillation. So they're not making, they're not getting enough sales to, not enough case sales to warrant uh, dropping, you know, new make into barrels. So that is actually uh, something that I flag as, as scary. Now, here's the thing. All of that is to say that we are what what I think we are seeing is I think that we are seeing a um, customer base that knows what it wants now. I think I think we've seen a lot of people trying new things. Uh, there's a lot of things that are are sexy and cool, and uh, they've tried them, and now they want to go with what they like. And I don't know I don't know if that is good for the industry. But I do know that sales are not hurting. The category itself is doing just fine. I want to give you a few numbers from both the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States and the Kentucky Distillers Association. So Discus reported uh, just a couple days ago that American spirit exports were $2.2 billion, 63% of which was American whiskey. So I have been told by numerous brands that they are putting their focus back into the international markets. In particular, they are beginning to target China uh, and Australia and focusing more on Europe and South America. But I've had a couple brands tell me that they are putting, they're doing product launches in Beijing over, over Tokyo. So if you have, if you, in, in Tokyo is like a major American whiskey city. So if we are beginning to see uh, distillers put a focus on, on China, which I have a book. Uh, let me see if I have it right here. Yeah. So, I mean, they, in China, they translated my book, Bourbon Curious. Uh, and so if you're, if you're in China, you can find my, my book out there. And so this is, this is a market that everyone is, is focusing on. Uh, the Chinese people and the, and the people in the spirits industry in China 
are wanting more American whiskey there. So I think you're going to see a big effort from the larger companies on China and other parts of the world. But so exports are strong. So that's always a good indicator for the, the industry as a whole, especially the larger companies. Now, this is one that's specific to Kentucky distillers in that there is a $9 billion economic output for tourism. So the Kentucky Bourbon Trail, this, that stat comes from the KDA, by the way. Um, you have the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. You have Buffalo Trace, which is not on the Bourbon Trail, doing incredibly well bringing in tourists. You have all these people just wanting to come and smell the air, touch the barrels, um, and sip some whiskey. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And that is one of the things that people always talk about the bourbon boom busting and, you know, comparing it to past years. You know, in 19, 1968 to 1972, when we saw light whiskey come out and uh, that'd be an enormous failure and vodka start, was really cleaning the clock of bourbon, that was not a period of tourism. And so now we have a different world where we have people traveling to Kentucky just to see a distillery. We also have whiskey media. Take a look and get on Instagram sometime. If you're not on Instagram, you know, stay away from it probably. But get on social media sometime and see how many people uh, have bourbon handles, right? Or see how many how many people are on Twitter just talking about whiskey all the time. I mean, for God's sake, I make my living drinking with people and talking about whiskey. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. I pinch myself every single day that I'm able to do this. So that is a, a very big difference between now and, and yesterday. We're in the middle of a $5.2 billion uh, building boom. So distillers are putting all that investment into new infrastructure, also a KDA stat. So the question is, you know, if they're building all that, are they just going to let it collapse? You know, I'd say not. I'd say they're gonna put, they're gonna keep this momentum going. And there's also a 475% uh, production increase. So that's the, abs that's the production, like right now it's increased 475%. And you're looking at 12.6 million barrels aging. So those stats are all very, uh, are, are very much pointing toward a healthy industry. But you do have to, you do have to wonder if these stats and if the growth and the uh, positives for American whiskey are only with the big brands. And that is something that I do think about a lot. And the big brands are always going to be fine, right? And they just, you know, they just move one thing to another. Somebody has an MBA. If they lose their job, they're going to be working for somewhere else. Like, I don't know, Colgate or BMW. I don't know why I said those companies, but I did. And if it's a small distiller, a small business, you know, that's hard. It's hard right now if you are a small distiller. You cannot compete with the big guys. You cannot, uh, you know, generate the kind of marketing dollars you need to get in front of somebody. So I, I would say, you know, if you genuinely care about some of the small distillers, if you genuinely care about the industry, you know, patronize where you can, go to the gift shop, buy a set of coasters, try to, uh, try to buy a bottle in the store, you know, do, do what you can to help, uh, to help the smaller distillers and the independent bottlers too, the people who are doing blends of straights. If you like them, support them, uh, and make them your go-to because here's the thing. If, if these little trends that are coming from, re if, if these go more mainstream outside of the people I've talked to, if more people start, you know, not sipping on some of these brands, they're going to go away. Small distillers are going to go away if you do not support them. So the industry's great. Oh boy, it's, it's, it's great. But if you don't have customers, it's not great for you. So I, I'd like to encourage anybody out there that has a, a small distiller or an independent bottler that they support, put them in the comment section and tell people why they should go check them out. Uh, I'll throw one at you. I just tasted this, reviewed it for my whiskey club, Club Marzipan Panfei. This is a uh, straight whiskey out of Pennsylvania. I'd say support them. If you wanna see that review, go check out 
my club marzipan you will find details in it on it in the description that's going to do it here folks uh be safe out there and remember the whiskey boom the bourbon boom is not going away but we might start seeing some brands shut her off and just you know that doesn't mean the whole industry is collapsing that's going to do it here folks be safe out there and remember vodka sucks cheers <laughs>